that I just got. Yeah, you know, it was like twenty. Mocha bucks. pot. Yeah. Did you actually say that publicly? <laughs> sure, absolutely. Yeah, I drink out of a really good coffee, and it's delicious. <laughs> All right, this is episode 58, and today we are talking about the U.S. imposed export restrictions on advanced semiconductors, Glorify Bank, and we have more lightning round questions at the end. Last Friday, the U.S. imposed new export restriction, restrictions on advanced semiconductors and chip manufacturing equipment in an effort to prevent American technology from advancing uh, China's military power. Will this policy be effective, or, or will it just end up hurting the U.S.? So uh, the, the first reaction I have is, is you know, two big thumbs up. Um, I think it's in general just bad policy for uh, the United States, whether it's public institutions or, or private businesses, to be exporting, you know, key technologies to an adversarial or competing country. Um, just as a general policy, I think that's bad policy. Uh, but... The more you think about it, China doesn't really do high-end semiconductors. That's usually like Taiwan and and South Korea. Um, I've heard one tech analyst put it this way, that the kind of semiconductors that China generally does are the kind that make your coffee pot sing, not really the kind of thing that operates fighter jets or, you know, pickup trucks or anything like that. Um so I, I don't think this is going to have a particularly big impact. Uh, some, some supply chains for semiconductors will be impacted for companies like TSMC, which is the world's largest high-end semiconductor producer. They're located in Taiwan, but they have a one-year exemption to move some of their low-end manufacturing from semiconductors out of China to other adjacent countries. Um, so I, I like the move. I don't think it's going to have in and of itself, this one specific move will probably not have a huge impact. Um, but again, overall, I think it's right direction. I, I tend to lean much more libertarian in my economic views. And I, I, I believe that the, the more open trade you have, the less tension you have with the rest of the world. Also, uh, trying to prevent China from getting some of our technology by, by banning the sale of semiconductors to them doesn't seem as effective to me in terms of military policy as just beefing up our military. You know, rather than spending bazillion dollars in diversity, inclusion, and, uh, and, uh, and that kind of stuff, maybe we should be teaching people how to blow things up and kill people. And uh, that might be a better way of spend, using our money. So if, if we actually, if our, if our military was actually a true deterrent to China, I don't know if we'd even be having this conversation. I guess I don't see why you wouldn't do both. Um, but as far as like a technological power, uh, you know, I, I don't think China has proven itself uh, in that area at all. I mean, a good example would be their, uh, their, you know, they've been trying to make an airplane to compete with uh, Boeing and Airbus for at least a decade now. And they still don't have anything that can compete with what those two companies have. And the only way it's basically going to work is if China says, you know, everybody, every Chinese airline has to use, you know, I think it's like the C, I, I can't remember what it's called, but they have to use whatever the Chinese produced um, air, air, aircraft is. But but the safety ratings and the range and the quality are nowhere near Airbus or Boeing. So, you know, China is, is already not, it has trouble with technological advancement. So if you're going to cut off the flow of semiconductors and the tools to make semiconductors um, on top of all the other problems that China has right now, I think it's, it's definitely going to be effective. <clears throat> all right. Uh, Ken Griffin, Peter T Ken Griffin and Peter Thiel, along with other uh, investors invested tens of millions of dollars into a new kind of startup called the Glorify bank. The bank is marketed towards people that believe traditional wall street banks are too liberal. The bank was supposed to launch in, in April, but the launch was delayed because of severe financial issues. And at one point, uh, the, the bank came very close to bankruptcy. Um, are Glorify's troubles a bad omen for other anti-woke companies, or is this just typical growing pains for, for any organization? Um, in general, I think this is a good idea with poor execution. Um, 
the more you read about it, the more it sounds like you had, you know, a, a similar issue to what a lot of these, you know, big tech startups or other kinds of startups have. We have some, you know, big personalities with a lot of money who think they can throw money at something and hype and, you know, society will kind of solve the rest of the problem without having to come up with a detailed business plan and, you know, build things from the ground up over the course of several years. Um, not that I'm at all qualified to build a multi-billion dollar bank or anything, but just reading about many of the uh, behaviors of some of the founders, you know, how the company was operated. I mean, it just doesn't sound like it was a particularly professionally run operation. Um, I don't think the idea is bad. I think there is a market to be served uh, for millions, tens of millions of Americans who would much rather deal with a business, a bank, you know, a, a real estate lender, whatever, who aren't using part of their money, charging them fees, whatever, to promote ideas that they disagree with. So um, maybe this, you know, maybe Glorify will eventually launch and be a successful business. I don't know. I think businesses like it will certainly find a niche in the American economy and do well. Again, I don't know if it'll be this it seems like these gentlemen make quite a bit of money in the, in the tech field, but we're talking about finance. And sometimes people who know a lot about one industry who have a lot of money and they want to dabble in other industries, they generally um, get get cooked pretty good. And I think that's kind of the case here. Is that sounds like you know, was a glorified bank, a, glor, a, a glorified bank. Mm -hmm. They are to you know. Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, as uh, as MeWe is to, uh, or I'm sorry, that Truth Social is to Facebook, mm -hmm. is that uh, they're trying to get into a market that's dominated by, by some big players, and they're doing it primarily for um, ideo ideology regions, as opposed to, man, we have a really good idea to, to do banking more efficiently. Um, I, I think they're 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 dabbling in things they don't know, and that's the reason for their problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like uh, gro growing pains, but also it sounds like they're sitting around a, uh, you know, like a pub on a Friday night and be like, what if we built a bank that offered a card made of bullet casings? And somebody's right. like, that's a great idea. Let's do it. You know, and then they had all these other, you know, they got a bunch of people together and then had this bank and then, you know, try, tried to, you know, bite off more they can chew. And it sounds like they're they're kind of writing the ship, you know, they, they kind of narrowed it down, just focused on, I think, uh, you know, uh, savings and checkings accounts or excuse me, saving, savings accounts and checking accounts. And then they, they offer a credit card and then they're going to offer loans and, and other services in the future. So it sounds like instead of having all these, uh, you know, these little uh, novelty items, they kind of just narrowed it down to, you know, the, the important things or just like, you know, just going to do the simple things well and then build their bank off of that. And then once you generate revenue, that would be the time to try and, you know, develop a card made out of like bullet casings or whatever and, and try and make it work. So it, they definitely had some issues. You know, I, I looked up their website today and it looks like it's open and it looks like they're taking business. Um, but yeah, this sounds like just like internal issues for, you know, for Glorify, not necessarily an omen for the, uh, for the company. Um, there are a number of uh, companies popping up too. You know, we talked about that, uh, that y'all fund or the, uh, the God bless America fund, which basically only invests in, you know, what are deemed to be anti woke uh, companies. So, you know, there's definitely a niche market for it. Um, but how big it'll get, I, I have no idea. <clears throat> I would also point out that, uh, like, they're, you know, switching from McDonald's to Burger King for lunch is not that big of a deal. But changing banks, credit card companies, loan providers, et cetera, is kind of a big pain in the butt. Yeah. And people hate doing it. It's, you know, especially the more stuff you've signed up for through your credit cards, debit cards, you know, your PayPal account. What's auto, what card automatically pays for Netflix, that kind of thing. So it's like a really big hassle to change banks. Um, whereas it's not that big of a hassle to go to a different sporting goods store or restaurant or something. Um, so in general, I think people will have to really, really hate their bank before they're willing to, to change it. Um, yeah. So there, probably some of that will, you know, if they haven't experienced it already, you know, the, they'll they'll bump up against some of that as a challenge also. No, that, that's a great point, is that if your bank that you're with, especially like a local bank, is not doing anything that's going to irritate you, yeah, changing banks is a pain. And, uh, and yeah, you know, 
know, yeah, if, if you're not unhappy with your bank, I, I see that being a barrier to entry for uh, for Glorify, for sure. But it, it, it sounds like the business plan is that they're targeting people who, who are upset with their bank. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe not. They're not upset with the low interest rates or the high fees. They're they're in, they're they're upset because the bank is uh, is is spending their time talking about things that the customer doesn't want them talking about. They want them talking about banking, not not woke ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I wonder though is like if you know because that's been going on for a while. So I'm wondering if a lot of them have already changed banks went through the hassle of changing banks and now they belong to like their local credit union or something that, that maybe isn't as opinionated. And I, I wonder if they're, uh, they're willing to, to make the change uh, again to, to something like this. I, I, I think you only get one chance at a first impression and, and it's quite possible that Glorify rolled out of the chute and, and disappointed enough customers in the beginning that the referral to, to, to jump ship and go over hasn't been overwhelming. If, 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 if I go over to Glorify Bank and I have a wonderful experience and I go to you two gentlemen and say, hey, man, being over Glorify is great. Here's why uh, you're more apt to do it. But if I go over to Glorify and I'm put on hold and they mess up the paperwork and they didn't do the ACH transfer like they were supposed to, it, uh, it's, it, it'll it cool my jets and enthusiasm for, for getting you two to, to sign up. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on to the uh, to the lightning round. All right, uh, Kanye West, who now goes by uh, Ye, or, or Y-E, uh, agreed to buy Parler, uh, a conservative social media app, uh, uh, after other platforms suspended him from making anti-Semitic posts. Uh, do you think Parler is going to make a comeback, or is Kanye uh, late uh, to the party? <laughs> um, so, I don't know if he's late to the party, but... Parler is just one of many pretty small niche Facebook and Twitter alternatives. Um, I don't I don't know if this is going to have much of an impact on the social media landscape. Um, he, he he can buy it. You know, Trump has his own. Kanye West now has is going to have his own. Uh, interestingly enough, though, Pew Research recently did a survey of all social media platforms and found that Gab was the only one that doesn't censor speech beyond what federal law mandates. Um, so if if you're looking for a place that is, you know, as close to you can get as a free speech haven, Gab is it. It's not Parler, it's not, you know, Truth Social or anything like that. So it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing, but I don't know if it's gonna have much of an impact on Parler. If, uh, unless you two gentlemen are enthusiastic about going to parlor i don't think it's a good idea is that uh you know the numbers of i wish i had a nickel for everybody who said they were going to go off facebook who were off facebook for three weeks and went right back on facebook because they're being they're held hostage by their kids and their grandkids who uh, who are on facebook uh even though they disagree with with facebook they're not going to go to parlor because parlor doesn't have the network effect that facebook has and unless your generation is going to use Parler and, and, and put cute pictures of your kids on, on, on Parler for, for grandma and grandma to see, I just don't think it's going to get off the ground. I, I think this has been done. I mean, Elon Musk is already in the throes of buying Twitter for similar reasons. And the thing with Elon is he's like one of the world's smartest people. I mean, he obviously made controversial comments, but he does have a, a space exploration company. He did develop a car company. And uh, he's proven his aptitude in a number of areas, whereas Kanye West is is a is a rapper and uh, and basically says a lot of ridiculous things. So I, I don't think he's going to draw the same crowd that that, that Elon Musk is with Twitter. And so I, I think he is late to the party. I think this this card has already been played, and uh, you know the, the the best hope of somebody, you know, making a, a uh, you know taking one of these existing platforms and making them a you know a truly free speech platform probably lies with uh, Elon Musk and Twitter. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and ruin the lightning round. You know, I, I think what would really serve the, you know, conservative alternative social media market is if it wasn't so fragmented. Uh, one of the, one of the big problems is that you just kind of have little, little echo chambers where, you know, a handful of people with a handful of interests go and they just remove themselves from public discourse entirely. 
and nobody else, no, you know, at, at that point, nobody hears it, you know. The only reason anybody knows what Trump says on Truth Social is because somebody takes a screenshot of it and posts it on Twitter. So, you know, I, if these guys really wanted to challenge the, you know, the Facebook hegemony, they should probably find a way to consolidate. That, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, right. there, there is one area that I find intriguing, and that's Rumble. Do you, do you ever see posts from Rumble? No, it's the, the YouTube alternative. Oh. Yes. I, I, I obviously run in more conservative circles than maybe YouTube do, Boo, but uh, uh, I'm seeing Rumble a lot lately. It, uh, um, a year ago, I saw it occasionally, but now I'm seeing it quite often. Yeah, I, I've not. I, you know, I think uh, somebody told me that the other day, and that, that was the first I'd ever heard of it. So. Yeah, I'm trying to think what. There, so there's Rumble now. Um, there was another one that for a while was trying to challenge YouTube, but I can't remember what it was called. It kind of got blacklisted everywhere because Alex Jones and a, you know people like that ended up dominating it, and so now you're like banned from sharing those links on a lot of social media platforms. Um, I wish I could remember what it was called. I haven't seen that one kind of popped up, was popular for a while, and then it just kind of died. So I, I'll have to look into what that was called. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll move on to, to the next one here is that, that Netflix is considering showing its original movies in a brick and mortar movie theater. Um, do you think this is a good business strategy for them? Or you know, why would they want to go with brick and mortar instead of just you know, keep doing what they're doing? <clears throat> so I'll be a little more uh, tight with this answer, but. They've done this, I think, once before with a movie called Beasts of No Nation. They put it in some theaters because I think they wanted it for Academy Awards con uh, consideration. Um, and one of the rules of Academy Awards consideration is it has to be in at least like one theater or several theaters for two weeks. So anything that Netflix, any movies that they want to be considered for Academy Awards consideration will probably have to be in theaters. Um, so I think that's a reason why they would why they would do it. Uh, the other one is if they're producing big budget films, um, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on it, it's much harder to justify doing that when you just have a slew of customers paying a monthly fee. If you put a movie in theaters that you think is gonna be big, that's gonna generate hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office, maybe a billion, it's much easier to recuperate those those production and advertising costs and then anything that you get from the streaming revenues is you know icing on top of the cake so i i think it makes sense if they're going to be doing big budget blockbuster type movies to do it i think they're trying to capture the market they lost which are all the people who are frustrated and disgusted with some of the woke turns that they've made it, when you go to a movie you don't know that it was produced by mgm until you're already sitting in the chair and you don't know that it's a touchstone picture until you're already sitting in the chair. And I think that Netflix has some material that if they put it on their own platform, there's a large swath of America who are not going to subscribe to Netflix to see it. But they might go take in a dinner and a show and go watch a movie and then find out it's a Netflix movie while they're sitting in the chair. I don't know. I mean, Q, uh, Q2 earnings from Netflix came out, and they're you know they're back on a uh, on a growth trajectory. So they went through a period there where they were losing a lot of subscribers, and in in uh, the second quarter they actually gained uh, quite a few subscribers again. And what I would suspect is happening is that more people they have their tech stack. They have like Disney, they have Netflix, they have Discover, and whoever else is out there. But they don't want to pay for all these subscriptions every month. So my guess is that they sign up for Netflix, watch the movies and the shows they want to watch on Netflix, and then cancel the subscription, and then go over to uh, to Hulu or Disney or whoever else, do the same thing over there. Once they're you know, satisfied with what they've watched for a little bit, they'll cancel that subscription and go back to Netflix. And I think what Netflix wants is, you know, they have the uh, the, the steady stream of revenue, but they also want to, to generate, you know, the you know, they basically want to hit a home run, but they want like a, a Jurassic Park type movie where not only does it show in the US, but they can show it abroad and generate, you know, like huge, you know, blockbuster type uh, revenue to go with the company, just just like Alex said. But, but my guess is that Netflix is catching on to the fact that people are, are subscribing and then they're canceling. And then, you know, and that, that kind of makes their revenue a little bit more uncertain. 
and uh, and so yeah, th this is a this is a tactic to uh, to kind of generate more revenue for the company. Personally, I I'm, I'm not going to the theater. My, my, my wife and I went to a, to a theater, you know, back in September, and that's the first time we've been there in a couple of years, and it was gross. I mean, the, the seats were like old and broken. The the, st the the floors were sticky. You know, the people next to you smell in our uh, or obnoxious, and uh, I, I would prefer just to watch whatever movie they create in uh, in the comfort of my own home. <laughs> Well, you talk about Netflix uh, growing their subscriber uh, base in the, in the second quarter. Did you see the demographic breakdown? Did that happen primarily in the United States, or was that those global numbers? Because it, you know, how you how you market is different overseas than how you market here, and they may be gaining new subscribers overseas, but seeing a, a decline or even or, or staying neutral here in the United States. So I think they can. They may be growing their their base overseas, but really they're not growing their American base. I, I don't know. I, I don't. I can't support that. I would disagree with that analysis. But um, I uh, I would uh, I would have to look. I, I didn't did not see a breakdown in, uh, in demographics of their uh, of their growth for uh, for second quarter. But that'd be something to look at though. Um. <clears throat> All right, uh, so we'll move on to the last one here. Is that according to an article on studyfinds.com, there is a new way of getting a permanent tattoo without the pain of having to undergo or uh, having to go under the needle. The new technology is a form of skin patch that contains microscopic needles and is supposedly painless, bloodless, and speedy. Uh, does this make you want to get inked? So first of all, I did remember um, that YouTube alternative is called BitChute. Uh, so FYI, it was BitChute. Uh, otherwise, with tattoos, no, probably not a permanent tattoo. Uh, pain of it isn't really keeping me away from it. It's just not particularly interested in getting a tattoo. Uh, a temporary tattoo, though, I would consider that could be pretty fun. You know, get something weird that would only last a few days or whatever. You know, just as a joke or who knows. Get something for you know Christmas. Could be fun. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, uh, uh, I, I got a tattoo, you know, many, many years ago before you two were even born, uh, primarily because there was only three demographics who had tattoos, convicts, bikers, and warriors. And uh, the idea that uh, you got a tattoo, it was the pain was part of the entry. Uh, the fact that it's easy to get one doesn't make it more attractive to, 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 to me anyway. Yeah, I'm. I'm not going to get a tattoo. Not because of the so much because of pain. Like I can't think of anything that I'd want to print on my body for the rest of my life. Um, that I'm like, you know, that I think would look good. I mean, I've seen. I think I saw, and maybe I'm remembering this wrong, but there was a kid in high school who had his girlfriend's name tattooed on his back, and uh, that 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 child needed needed some better parents because that was a <laughs> horrible, horrible decision. Um, you know, Did so, they stay so don't do that. <laughs> What's that? Did they stay together? No, they did not. So you got some some girl's name tattooed on your back. Definitely a bad uh, choice. Yeah, that, that was a bad choice. And I think I think you can get them removed. I think there is some procedure you can go under to, to get them removed, which is also painful. But no, even if a tattoo is easy, I can't think of anything that would want, um, you know, <laughs> to put on me for for that long. I guess I don't know. So, so no. <clears throat> All right. All right. Uh, well, that's it. We got about three minutes left, so we're good on time. But uh, that's all we have for episode 58, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.